Hey, Preacher Girl, welcome to the PG Podcast. It's so great to be with you again. So exciting to be in your living room or in your AirPods, wherever you are right now listening to this podcast. Before we jump in, I got to tell you something. I got to say thank you for being a PG. Thank you for being an insider. Thank you for being in the community. Thank you for reaching out to the other Preacher Girls and letting them know that you're there, that the podcasts are meaning something to you. But if you're watching, if you're listening, do us a favor, like this video, like this podcast, and jump on the community and let somebody know that it's a blessing to you. Who knows, you might be a blessing to somebody else. Anyway, this episode is going to be awesome because I have taken some of the most intense and crazy important lessons that I've learned from some of the most difficult experiences I've ever been through and just condensed them into this podcast for you. So uh, originally I thought it was going to be the three lessons I learned the hard way, but it's actually going to be four because that's how it stretched out in my mind. So if you're ready, let's dive in. The first thing I want to tell you I learned the hard way is that All times are not created equal. Say it with me. All times are not created equal. When you do something is just as important as what you're doing. I know for some of you this is common sense, but for most of us, especially me, this was not common sense. Let me tell you why. Um, I don't know if any of you know what circadian rhythms are. Maybe you already know. Maybe you're very familiar with this kind of thing. Or maybe you heard it this way. Some of us are larks and some of us are owls. It means some of us are morning people and some of us are evening people. Well, no matter if you're a morning person or an evening person, you will go through a cycle during your day depending on whether you're a lark or an owl. Some of us, our productivity is highest in the morning and some of us, our productivity is highest in the evening. Then there are others of us who are most productive in the middle of the day. So, the very first thing I learned the hard way is that when you do something is just as important as what you're doing. During the day, all of us, regardless if we're morning people or evening people, we go through a cycle. So it looks like a peak and then there is a trough and then there is a rebound. So it's for many of you that that trough is that three o'clock fall asleep at your desk. Your rebound is when you catch your second wind, but your peak is where you are most alert, most effective. You can really run, you can really move, you can really think, you've got your creative juices flowing, that's your peak. All of us have those three steps, but it's always in that order, peak, trough, and rebound. For some of us, we peak in the morning, at seven in the morning, at eight in the morning. It's when we remember best. It's when we can cram for an exam. It's when we can do those analytical, really difficult tasks. Don't give us anything to do at two because we're in a trough. We're in a valley. We cannot think straight. We can't focus right. And then in the rebound, we can probably do some stuff, but just not at the level that we're doing it in the peak hours. There are people in my life, like Fanny, for instance, her best, her her peak is four o'clock in the morning. She will go to bed and wake up so early to work on videos. And then there are other people in my life, uh, like my mom, who she must wake up early in the morning and get the hard stuff done. What am I saying? I learned the hard way that forcing myself to get it done when people say it needs to be done causes me to lose some of the excellence in how I do things. So I schedule the hardest stuff, the studying for the sermon, the research for the book, the the making of the podcast in my peak hours, which is early afternoon. It's when I'm my most energetic. It's when I feel like my brain thinks better. In the morning, I'm a little fuzzy. In the evening, I'm really mellow. But right in the afternoon, around four, five, is when I feel my strongest. It makes sense. That's when I'm gearing up for church. That's when I have to be on my game. So it's when I want to do those hard thinking things, the more difficult tasks. So once you know when you're at your peak, when you're most alert, schedule the hard things then. The most difficult things, the challenging stuff, the stuff that you have to think about, put it at your peak times. Don't kill yourself by putting the hard things in your trough times, those weaker times, those times when your mind just is not processing. Your rebound time, listen to this. Lean in, put your creative things then. Because you don't want 
to try to be creative when you're in peak season. Why? Because your brain is too analytical. You're going to throw away ideas because you already discount them. They won't work. You put your creative things in your rebound time. You put nothing if possible in your trough time and you put your analytical things in your peak times. The trick is knowing which one you are. That's something I learned the hard way. Yesterday we came up with ideas for our parade this year and there were about I guess 50, 50 of us there but we had to come up with ideas that children would love and that had fun and energy and an excitement to it and what we couldn't do what I realized was a lot of people were coming out of work they were either in trough or they could have been in peak or they could have been in rebound I needed them to be in rebound why because rebound is where creative juices where creativity is sparked you don't want to be so analytical when you're being creative if you are a maker if you are a chef if you are a, a um if you make jewelry if you do makeup you want to do that stuff in your rebound time in your peak time you you analyze you do your budgets but in your rebound time is when you're being creative so how i started the meeting yesterday was by having everybody play the go fish game not the card one but the one with the fishing rod and when everybody was laughing and and being childish and cracking up on each other then their creativity sparked. We got in a matter of minutes, hundreds of ideas about things that we could do, things that would have never happened had they been under pressure of a deadline. For your children, those of you with kids, when they come home from school, figure out when they're in peak, when they're in trough. I know you're saying when they come home from school, they're done, they're no good, but there's gonna be a time for some of them that's their trough but for some of them that's creativity time and you use that to their advantage they'll learn so much better so the second thing I learned the hard way is this understand the riptide now when I was in Hawaii five years ago I, I took a surfing class I know so we we, we had to swim like way out to sea and it was nerve-wracking because you know you're far out in Hawaii there are sharks there if a big wave comes you know all of those things can happen but something that the the surf instructor said to me stuck with me forever and it taught me a very valuable lesson he asked me how come all the water doesn't just keep going to the shore he said wave after wave why isn't the water all the way inland why is it that the surf ends here and you know what I realized that this the waves break but then it pulls you back I didn't only learn that in Hawaii this last Sunday we had a baptism and the wave was crashing me onto the sand and sucking me back in well that motion of getting you getting sucked back into the water that's a riptide that's what that's called it runs perpendicular to the shore it's literally by the way like a river within the ocean flowing in the opposite direction of the wave right you, people call it a current people call it different things but it is a riptide now hear this he said if you ever get caught in a riptide where you're being sucked into the ocean do not swim out he said whatever you do don't try to swim out the result is going to be you're going to get sucked way in deep he said turn your body do a turn and swim across you want to swim parallel to the shore so you're going to the side and when you get out of the riptide then you can swim out what am I saying so many times especially in ministry in entrepreneurship in motherhood in whatever it is you're doing in your job you face that kind of opposition you face people who don't like you you face difficult situations that you don't know how to get out of and what you start doing is fighting it and fighting it and pushing against it and what I've learned the hard way is that just sucks you in so the more you try to get out of a riptide or out of a current or out of a negative situation by facing it head on is what you've heard the more it sucks you in and consumes your life change your focus turn your direction swim parallel to the shore and you will get out and then when that is no longer the only thing you're seeing it's easier now this is the part that blew my mind that I learned the hard way surfers use the riptide to their advantage oh my gosh it was so 
good. You know what they do? So when we got out to the shore, he said, all right, we're going back in and we're gonna ride the next wave out. And your girl was just like, I'm never gonna get there. And I'm just swimming. But he was there like 10 minutes before me. And I was like, how did you do that? He found the riptide, the same thing that would suck him in to the, to the deep. And since he needed to be there, he just got in it and let, him t let it take him all the way. And by the time I got in the deep, I was exhausted. But the time he got in the deep, he was ready to ride the next wave. What is that saying? The Bible says that whatever the devil meant for harm for you, that God turns it around in your favor. And what he's saying there is, even if it looks impossible and your opposition is fierce, don't be afraid of it. Sometimes you just ride that thing all the way to where you need to be. You just make sure that whatever Satan's bringing as opposition, if all it does is strengthen your muscles, it's enough. Just like our little girl Claire that we heard in our last week's podcast. Remember what she went through? but it made her faithful, it made her stronger, it, it made her focus more resolute. Same thing, no matter what the opposition is, even if Satan meant for it to take you out, you just get on top of that and use it to take you in. Deeper in Christ, deeper where you need to be. And I guarantee you, you're gonna catch a wave that you're gonna enjoy all the way out at the end of that. And that's something I learned the hard way. Maybe one of the most difficult lessons I've ever learned as a preacher, girl, and one that I hope you learn the easy way, which is by listening to me rather than having to go through it all your life, is to develop the positives. Now, before you think this is all about your body image, it has nothing to do with that. Now, let me tell you what I mean. If you are a photographer, especially one that is a professional, or you worked way back, way back, when remember we had Fujifilm? I remember there was a dark room. Well, in high school, we got to go in the dark room and we developed film. But you know what the film was called that we developed? It was called a negative. And so we learned to develop negatives. We learned to take a negative and make a photograph out of it. But you know something about when you develop negatives, you know where you have to be? In the dark. You have to stay in the dark in order for negatives to develop. Now that sounds like, so what does that have to do with me? Well, the Lord used that to teach me a very valuable lesson in life because I spent most of my life as a minister trying to develop negative people, trying to take those who were down in the dumps all the time or always found something bad to say or could find every problem, every criticism and try to get them to like me or try to get them to get on board or the ones who didn't do anything and complained all the time, try to get them to change an attitude. Meanwhile, the positives would suffer because I would spend all my time with the negatives, trying to get them to come up to the level and I would abandon the positives and those that, were, that had the right attitude or had the right work ethic or were side by side with me felt left out because I was so busy trying to develop the negatives. So unless you are a photographer, develop the positives get with the people hang with the ones who keep encouraging you and if they're seeing the bad it's only because we can change that unless they have a suggestion to fix the problem then they don't really need to even talk about the problem unless they're willing to put their 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 hands to the plow to get a solution to something they see as an issue then shh about it i've learned over time that the the empty vessels will always make the most noise and as a pastor you don't want anybody to fall fail not like your church or anything like that so I spend a lot of time trying to figure out okay should I buy them gifts um, should I send them a note should I do and the Holy Spirit really had to check me in that and said unless you are a photographer start developing the positives because there are people who want to learn who want to follow, who want to be obedient to the Spirit. And it doesn't mean they're always saying yes, but they're always looking for solutions rather than problems. So honey, if you are being dragged down by the people in your circle, if you're being dragged down by your company, ask yourself, I am, am I trying to develop negatives? 
instead of developing the positives. I guarantee you it's going to change your perspective. It's going to change the way you live your life. You'll still be allowed to help people, but the positives is going to have a positive impact on you. And that's something I learned the hard way. Now, I got to tell you, um, I learned hundreds of things the hard way. I'm one of those stubborn people myself. So if you're in that you're that way you're in good company but this fourth one is so elementary that the lord really had to pass it before my eyes a million times for me to get the get the clue and it's body language screams loudest and um i wrote a book a, a decade more ago called song of the shulamite secrets of an irresistible woman and the book talked about um, what I learned from the Shulamite in that book about being irresistible and uh, one of the things one of the chapters there is about the way you communicate and the way people uh, perceive what you're saying I learned the hard way that what people hear is way more important than what you're saying sometimes and I'm still learning it by the way sometimes I say things or people say things and our intention as we intended to say it is totally lost and what people hear is something completely different what I learned the hard way is that I can't have an attitude that's not what I meant it doesn't matter what you mean as long as your listener understands what you're saying then you have communicated effectively so, I thought we could do something fun to end the video with this last tip. And here are three not so popular ways that body language can really, really change the way you communicate. We all know the ones about eye contact. If you're talking to somebody, watch them, look at them, look, you know, look them in the eye. Everybody knows that. You ever heard the saying, what you say is 80% what your face is doing and 20% the words that are coming out of your mouth well that's the truth and um there was some some research done a little while ago that that showed bosses who were speaking to their employees and they took all the sound off and just by looking at the way that the employer or the manager was sending out subtle signals micro signals they could tell who were the favorites who were not the favorites and then do you know what happens that employee begins to perform according to that boss's micro signals isn't that crazy same thing with children even though you think you're being affirmative the way your face facial expression is the way your body is is moving and the way your hands are used all of those things speak volumes it's not just the words you're communicating and even in today's 21st century with texting then body language is lost on people they don't know how to speak to people. They don't know how to communicate effectively. So I thought I would give you three fun tips that you might not know about body language. It may not always work for you, but it's scientifically proven to work and I do most of them all the time without even knowing. You ready? When you go to a party or you go to an event, especially if it's a networking event, never stand at the door. Isn't that crazy? You're like, but you meet the most people that way. Studies have shown that if you want to collect the most business cards, make the most friends, get the most emails, get the most numbers, the place you want to be is at the return side of the food table, or if you're an alcoholic or a drinker, at the bar. Now, listen to it. It's so cool and it works. You should try it. So if you're trying to, to, to present yourself as friendly and you're standing at the door, when people walk into a room, they're sizing up the people. They're looking to see who they're intimidated by. They're, that's human nature. They're not doing it consciously, but they're watching. When you stand at the door, you have bouncer mentality. You look like you're opposing. You know what you're doing. Your first time there, they're not going to talk to you. They're, they're going to say hello and then move. When they go into the room, if they don't know anybody, they will automatically be lined for the buffet table so they can snack on something or get something to hold in their hand. When they get what they, they went for and turn around, that is where you want to be. Isn't that crazy? Right when they collect what they wanted and turn around, they have let their guard down. Why? Because they've just received something. And whoever is standing right there can strike up a conversation and nine times out of 10, people will talk to you. 
Is that genius? Try it. It really, really works. All right, tip number two. And this is another strategy that most people don't know. And it's called the I surrender strategy. Now, if you look at the most famous people on TV, when they walk out into a stage, onto a stage, into a room full of people, they walk out hands up. I, I know you never noticed before, but you're going to start noticing now. I do it a lot of times without even trying when I go, even now, when I go on stage to talk to my congregation and my headset's on so I don't hold the mic, I'm always like, hello everybody. Do you know what that is? That is the I have no weapons stance. Is that crazy? Just by putting your two hands up like this, it sends a subliminal micro message that you're unarmed, that you have no threat, that you have no weapon, and that person is safe with you. Now, I don't suggest you go into the room like, I got no weapons. No, that kind of kills the whole vibe. But while, when you walk in and your hands go up like this, it automatically says, I come in peace whenever they do you know that's what it's saying so that's tip number two i promise you that kind of body language will help it will help a whole lot third one i want to tell you is not so awkward or complicated but it sure is important and that's when people are speaking with you and um, they're in the middle of their sentence their words their thought don't look away I know that in this generation, people are easily distracted and they'll look away and they'll say, I'm listening, I'm listening. Nobody believes that. In fact, what you do automatically when you do that to somebody is you devalue whatever it is they're saying to you. Even if they don't feel automatically offended psychologically, that's a micro message that says that what you had to say, what they were saying to you was not that significant that they could, you could keep their attention. So if you want somebody to know that they're important to you and isn't that what we all want? when people are trying to communicate something to us. That's why I try to take the time when you get on the PG Girl community to like your comment. And you know, girls, a like on your sister's comment might seem like a nothing to you, but it is a big deal. It is a big deal to say great work or to say, I, I know what you're saying. I get you. I understand you. Or thumbs up. It doesn't really matter. But that does something inside of a person that makes them feel a little bit validated. And isn't that what great communication really is all about? Know this, whether you're making a conscious effort to do it or not, you are sending out micro messages constantly by the height of your voice, by the way your eyes look when you talk to people, by the gestures of your hands, by the way your body leans in. Some of us have blocking techniques. Um, you might not even know it. There was a show on TV the other day where a man could de detect liars just by looking at subtle movements in their eye. It was fascinating. You know that show was based on a real guy. Anyway, blocking techniques is like when you're talking to somebody and they automatically put their hands like this. Men do that a lot. Do you know that's a defense mechanism? It's a protector. Or if people take a, a photo together and it's two people but he's leaning this way. It's also another blocking technique. Another blocking technique. When people are talking to you and they cover their mouth, it's all about fear, intimidation. It's all about a little bit of hiddenness and you don't want those things to be the way you communicate. So, so that's my third tip. And it's something I learned the hard way is that sometimes it's not so much what I'm saying. It's what you are hearing that matters. And like I say, as long as I live, I'll probably still be learning that lesson. So for the PG giveaway this, this week, Beautiful sterling silver necklace with the PG pendant on it. One lucky PG insider is going to win it if you go on there and preferably post a little video of yourself saying which of these three techniques or which of the tips today mattered most to you. Or maybe you have one that you use all the time, a subtle micro um, technique to communicate better or a lesson that you learned the hard way. Any one of those things, just go up there, do a two minute video and tell us and then we'll vote and one of you will win. Anyway, thank you so much for being a part of my podcast today. Make sure you click that like button and if you haven't subscribed, do so. Please share it on your Facebook page, not necessarily on the PG community, but on your personal page and let somebody else hear this if it's been a blessing to you. I love you so much. I look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you.